In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. We all have our views on what it is to be Christian. And for many of us, it is to be strong, courageous, affirmed, confident. And when we fall short of any of those, we feel that something's wrong. Especially within our Coptic Orthodox Church, we have a particular struggle. And that struggle is um, that we read the Synaxarium, the life of the saints, at every service. And in reading it, we read these wonderful stories of valiant men and women who were so focused on their faith and so focused on what they were doing, and they were absolutely sure and they were so victorious. And we almost fall into this saint envy. You know, I wish I was that person. I wish I was that saint. I wish I could be like that. Not realizing that this is a process. These people live their lives as we live our lives in this world with the same struggles, the same tensions, the same weaknesses even the same doubts. A couple of weeks ago, the Archbishop of Canterbury was quoted in the tabloids, and it was said that he doubted his faith. Now, of course, it was taken out of context. What he was saying is that, yeah, I sometimes have my doubts, as we all do. If we look at the account of the Annunciation of St. Mary, where she was told by an angel in her home, sitting there minding her own business, as one does, when a, a heavenly appearance comes to you, visited by the angelic hosts, to tell you that you are going to be a vessel of God used in a way that is going to be profoundly central to the salvation of humanity. Her question was, how can this be? I'm sure she was afraid. Why would the angel have then said to her, do not be afraid, Mary? Fear is something that we live as a reality in our lives. We're not always sure. We're not always assured. We're not always even confident. But the fact that we struggle sometimes just means we're human. Don't be overtaken by this thought that says to you, if you don't have perfect faith and strength all the time, then God's not interested. You can't be a real Christian. Don't fall victim to that thought. Because there is a humanity and there is a reality in the weakness we all feel at times. And to reiterate that and to strengthen it, our God, the infinite God, took flesh and came to us as the incarnate Word and showed us all of the weakness of humanity, starting from being born as a fugitive in a stable and then fleeing and living as a refugee in Egypt, and then coming back as growing as a young child, as a young man, with all the struggles, having what might have been 
perceived as an overbearing mother, asking him to permit to, to, to perform um, a miracle he wasn't ready for at Cana in Galilee. And then going through all the struggles of hunger and thirst as he fasted before he started his ministry. The struggles of rejection and challenge when people spoke to him. The joy of being received by so many as a, a hero. But then being betrayed by so many who said, crucify him, crucify him. Crucified and dying. All of this is a reality of life. And if there was one way of us being taught all of this, it was that God took flesh and showed us all of this throughout his life. Saying to us, don't worry. If you experience any of this, if you feel any of this, it's okay. Because I came here to tell you that this is part of your humanity that I have come to sanctify. And I have come to raise you from that fear and from that weakness in a way that affirms you. Luke one twenty nine says that when our, our Lady St. Mary saw the angel, she was troubled at his saying. She was troubled at his saying. When we are sometimes troubled by the message that God appears to give us, we, we need to deal with that in our humanity. What we sometimes do is when we're troubled, we turn away from him saying, well, uh, Lord, I am no longer worthy to be in your presence. Or, God, why have you done this and why do you challenge me in this way? But actually by embracing it and saying, you know what? I don't understand. What do you mean? Have that conversation with God. What do you mean? Lord, I know you want to send me, but how do you want to send me? What message do you want to give me? And if I am incapable, how are you going to fix that or at least reassure me? When God spoke to Moses, and he said to him, I'm, I'm not a speaker. How can I go and speak to Pharaoh and release your people? God says, I've got a covered. Elijah, he says, Lord, I have impure lips. I've got a covered. St. Mary says, I don't know a man. I've got that covered too. St. Paul, as Saul, when he fell off his horse and said, Who are you, Lord? Our Lord said to him, I am the one you are persecuting, but I can fix that for you as well. So these struggles are lifelong struggles we will have, but they should not be struggles that will overcome us. Because in verse 30, the angel goes and says to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. God creates us to empower us. He doesn't create us and then discard us, just cast us aside. He creates us with a plan. And so we know that that plan is because we have found favor in his sight. Not because we've done necessarily anything very good, but we're his children. We're his children, he loves us and he wants to continue to provide that support for us. It is both humbling and empowering to feel that God places that much trust in us and that much value on us. 
Because for him, of course, as we read in verse 37, nothing is impossible. For God, nothing is impossible. If God wants to use us in a certain way, he'll make it happen. God's not short-sighted. God doesn't fall short in his plans. And if we feel that he's calling us to something, be assured that with that calling, we'll be given grace and ability to carry it through. Who would have thought that a young Jewish girl of very limited means, entrusted to an older man, living with him in, under his care, would suddenly become the mother of the Savior? The Savior that the whole of Israel was waiting for. This was a monumental, historic moment in the history of humanity. Now, of course, for our Jewish brothers and sisters, they're still waiting for the Messiah. But can you imagine those who chose to believe in him what an incredible exposition this must have been. They have been sitting for generations, reading the prophecies, being told that he is coming, being assured that God will not forget them, being promised a salvation and a savior. And suddenly he was there. Suddenly he was alive in their midst, waiting to walk ahead with them. That's why St. Mary is then able to say, my soul magnifies the Lord. My soul magnifies the Lord. I give glory to you, God, because I see your power. I see that you've taken me, an unknown, simple Jewish girl, living my life as I've been called, and suddenly you can take me and use me in your work of salvation for humanity. That's why my soul magnifies you. That's why I glorify you. I thought this was my life. I lived in the temple. I survived in the temple. I was fine in the temple. But it, time, it came time for me to leave. And I was praying that I would be in a safe place after this experience in the temple. And I was betrothed to this very kind man, Joseph. And he took me in. And he looked after me. And I've just been living but I didn't for a minute think that all of these wonderful prophecies that I've been reading, that my ancestors have been reading, that all those around me are still reading, will suddenly be fulfilled through me. So my soul magnifies you. If we ever feel too weak for God to work through, remember St. Mary. If we ever feel unimportant and unworthy, think of St. Mary. If we feel God doesn't care, think of her as well. But accept that with joy. God is constantly going to be pushing us beyond our comfort zones. If you thought your parents were overbearing, wanting you to get that 98% instead of the 95 because good Coptic children don't get 95% because you're 10% short of perfection, do the math. God is going to push us even further to that completion. 
He's not going to be unreasonable because he knows what he can do with us. But he's going to push us. So receive it with joy. St. Augustine has a wonderful saying, and he says, Mary's motherhood would have been of no profit to her if she had not joyfully born Christ in her heart. So if we accept what God wants begrudgingly and stomp our feet and complain and think, fine, God, that's what you want me to do? Fine, I'll do it. Like Jonah. You want me to go to Nineveh? Uh, absolutely, but I'd rather take this boat. And I'm going to hide from you. And then, if I'm going to go to the Ninevites, I don't believe you're going to do what you said you'll do. And then I get thrown into the water and, and consumed by a fish and vomited, vomited out, seriously? Vomited out. Let's not be Jonah. Could you imagine if Jonah had embraced what God had called him to do and said, Nineveh, great. You know what? I hear they're a tough act. I hear they're really, really difficult people, but I know you can do this. Not because I can do anything, but because you can do it through me. So, okay, fine, I'll go. It may not have been such a dramatic story, and we probably wouldn't have remembered his name so clearly today, but he would have been much happier doing it. But St. Mary said that. Let it be according to your word. I don't know what that means. I don't know what you're going to do for me. But let it be according to your word. Because I believe that you are the God of the impossible. And you can make of me whatever you want. We have to have a certain faith in God, not just in our own thought process, not just in our own assessment. We read in Hebrews 11.3, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. That's what he can do. That's how he guides us. We understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. Be and it will be. What did the centurion say when he came to our Lord? He said, I have people under my power. I know what it means to give a command. If you command that my servant be healed, he'll be healed. Are we of the same confidence in God's sovereignty? Do we believe that if God says, it will be? Or do we doubt ourselves and therefore doubt Him? Lord, you really think I can be useful? I don't think I can be useful. So how can you think you can make anything of me? I have no self-worth. So why should I believe that your view of me is right? And quite often, when we don't believe God, it's not because we don't believe Him, it's because we don't believe in ourselves. Really? You think you can take this clay, this lump of clay, and turn it into a beautiful, colorful vessel? Of course not. You're God, I know you're God, but I'm me. I'm just this lump of clay. St. Mary was that lump of clay, but she was molded and shaped and turned and colored and fired. But out of the furnace came this beautiful sculpture. being picked up out of the ground, elevated out of the ground, and then molded 
and shaped and then colored and then put into a kiln and fired. If clay could feel, that would not be the best of experiences. And we feel the same struggle. We feel this being pulled and shaped and squashed and squeezed. And we go through these experiences. And then we, we receive these colors of ownership and belonging. And we think, oh, this looks nice. But hang on, no, no, you're not shiny yet. It's not just about the colors. It's about the furnace. It's what brings up your shine. What makes you even more beautiful. And it sounds morbid. You know, Christians say to you, you have to have suffering. Well, yes and no. Quite often our journey entails suffering. But the suffering is never greater than the grace that accompanies it because our God is not an unfair God. He's not a brutal God. He's not a God that is going to put me into a position where I'm going to feel pain without giving me enough to overcome that pain. He's not going to put me into a situation where there are hurdles that I can't climb over or struggles that I can't overcome. The one thing we do want is to know what we're doing and why we're doing it. What is the purpose of our lives? Who was St. Mary and what was she doing? Who was Moses, Elijah, Saul? What were they trying to do? First Peter 1 Peter 1.15-16 But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. We're trying to achieve holiness. What is holiness? Godliness. So we're trying to be like God. As much as we can be. And in trying to be like God, we need to rely on Him to shape us and mold us. But we need to be trusting. Giving thanks. And I know it's really difficult to give thanks at times of struggle. Really difficult. The easiest thing in the world is to give thanks when things are fresh and rosy. I've passed, I've got that job, I'm in that relationship, I've got that house, I've got that car, I've got lots of friends, everyone likes me, I, oh, everything's great, and you walk like you're on cloud nine, and you're sort of gliding down the road, and people look at you and they smile, and you smile back at them, and you know, that kind of Hollywood presentation of the guy with the the little smile and the sparkle. And it's great, you can be thankful for that. But when it's a time of difficulty, what should I be thankful for? There is so much in our lives to be thankful for. The mere fact that we have a life beyond this one is something to be thankful for. The mere fact that this isn't it, because if this was it, We've been robbed. If it was just about living this life, in this struggle, in this world, with these obstacles, we've been robbed. But because there is another life, because there is something else, that's what we have to be thankful for. Because we still have a journey because this isn't the end. And because there is a God who can shape and form us and take us and use us, if we want. If we want. He's not going to do it against our will. He'll try to shape us for a bit, and if we object too much, he'll step back. But because he can't, 
but because he won't override that freedom that he gave us. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. The will of God for you is to give thanks. Give thanks. Rejoice. Be exceedingly glad. What lovely flowery language there. We always find lots to grumble about and to complain about, and sometimes rightly so. Heaven forbid if I may be saying to you here, don't ever complain, because there's always something to complain about. But it's the reality of looking at the other things in our lives that we have to give thanks for as well. Or even more, that even in that complaint, and, and this is pretty high up there, so we work at getting to this level, saying, Lord, I thank you for this struggle. I thank you for this difficulty, for this obstacle, because it is only through it, in this situation, that I will see you, that you will make your power evident, as St. Paul says, in my weakness. And so I give thanks for that. I thank you that you constantly try to shape and mold and make me into something that is far more beautiful and victorious and empowered and perfect. In the book of Jeremiah, God says, chapter 7, verse 23, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you will be my people. Walk in all the ways that I have commanded you, that all may be well with you. Hear my voice. Listen to what I'm saying. That is the answer. Hear God's voice. Listen to him. Obey him, and I know that word hurts us. We don't like obedience, because obedience gives an impression of powerlessness and listening to somebody else. But you know what? It's okay to listen to somebody else sometimes, especially when that somebody else is reliable and faithful. Whether it be your parents, your very good faithful friends, your spiritual guides, your confession fathers, God himself. Obedience is a good thing to the right people. Obey my voice. I will be your God. Because if you obey my voice, you're going to accept me as your God. I can only be your God if you take me as your God. Obey, I will be your God. And you shall be my people because you've accepted to come to me. Walk in the ways I've commanded you because this is the safe path. Again, not because I'm controlling you, but because I want to take you from being young Mary to the Theotokos, from being the shepherd to Moses who led people through the deserts, from Saul to Paul, from you today to you tomorrow. Walk in the way I have commanded that all may be well with you, in him, through him, with him. Glory be to God forever.